Hello and welcome to a special edition of the VC Circle podcast. My name is Narendra Kapoor and with me is VC Circle Assistant Editor Vrindesh Varan. And joining us today is serial entrepreneur and turnaround expert Jason Puthar. In India, Jason is best known for leading turnaround efforts at companies including Snapdeal, Housing.com and Freecharge. He began his career in the United States with Valiant Entertainment, a company he acquired while a student at Wharton. Valiant was later sold to the China and Hollywood-based TMG Entertainment. He has also served as an advisor to several companies, including Japan SoftBank. Currently, he sits on the board of directors of MR India, a subsidiary of the Bai Zaban Properties. Jason, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, Jason. So, currently, considering the situation we are in, we want to have your experience in terms of as a turnaround specialist. To begin with, how different turnarounds can be? from a situation like covid-19 compared to the general obstacles for a startup well when you look generally at turnarounds i mean what really is a business turnaround i mean it it's basically a reversal of, of a company's fortunes and that usually means a decline in revenues profits and or shareholder value due to not one factor but often a combination of factors like strategy team org structure product uh legal issues and so on uh therefore it usually requires a very holistic approach and understanding the interplay between different factors and input its inputs and outputs and that very much applies here as well but of course the one driving force behind all the turnarounds that are in effect happening or will be happening is uh this covid-19 so that's the way it's different but i think the approach is actually uh, very similar so do we have a playbook should the investors or and the startup founder should follow in a situation like this i i think you know every situation is different every business is different but there is um i i think kind of a broad approach or diagnosis or steps you can take which will be helpful so um i'll give you maybe six or seven examples that i think are you know may work well in today's climate so one i think the most important is to accept that sort of fear and anxiety is, is the new normal um you know considering the humanitarian crisis that's that's happened and unfortunately is likely to continue to happen i mean being fearful and anxious as a business leader i think should be accepted and uh i i think leaders need to uh not sort of fight it to accept it and try and rebalance themselves as much as possible because obviously a lot of key decision making falls in their hands and uh and a balanced leader uh leads to to good decision making so that's one because i see a lot of friends who are leaders who sort of fight it but i i i don't think that um makes sense um and i don't think it's abnormal i think the second is you know to put human beings first uh realize that a leader is a is a human being first and a business leader second so to ensure that you know the people you are responsible for uh including your team that you put their health and safety first and foremost i think not to lose sight of that uh you know sometimes very focused driven competitive leaders uh want results at all costs but i i think sometimes it's important especially in a situation like this to take a step back and say hold on we're you know you're a caretaker of people first and sort of a businessman second and don't don't forget that it's a very big responsibility you have as a leader um operating today because literally people's not just livelihoods but are, their lives are in your hands so i think that's that's very important uh i think those two are are quite specific to the current situation i think uh thirdly also very critical but is typical of uh, most turnarounds is you know the, you know your you know capital is the oxygen required for survival or your runway is your lifeline essentially that uh you know conserving capital effectively is literally the difference between business life or death uh that's true in a normal turnaround that's true in the current climate and extending that runway because we don't know how long this current uh crisis situation will continue for no one knows uh every business is affected differently um you know retail businesses are affected more dramatically than certain other businesses uh if you're operating in different markets depending on the stage the virus is in and the lockdown and the activity that also affects um your business differently so it's it's very different in different situations but essentially i think being able to outlast this crisis 
uh, surviving it and having it another chance for success is really, really important. Um, uh, another step I would say is to reevaluate re-eval- the strategy and plan based on the current situation, but not the vision. You know, I've seen companies today that are, you know, in the, you know, in a, in a very particular space and they've built fantastic capabilities, but now, you know, the business is on hold because of the environment and they're saying, oh, now let me get into hand sanitizers. I'm giving you a very extreme example. Uh, I, I think, and, and they're, and they kind of laying off people and essentially removing or destroying capabilities they may have spent many years building and honing. So I, I would not necessarily change the vision of your company. Maybe reevaluate the way you're approaching it based on the current reality, but don't, don't destroy capabilities, DNA, culture that you've built for kind of short term opportunities or opportunities that may be short term. Um, I think that's, that's very important. Don't overreact, essentially. Um, I think a, a, another step I would mention is, you know, there's a way to turn this crisis into opportunity. Um, you know, this, this period allows for companies to really focus on long-term initiatives, things like strategic reviews of their businesses, uh, culture building activities, brand building uh, some companies are resolving legal conflicts because the mood at the time, at this time, is more of uh, uh, more conciliatory, more uh, more of unity, more of compromise. So long pending disputes are being resolved. So I think there's a lot of ways to turn crisis into opportunity as well. And um, you know, the last two I'll mention right now is uh, align stakeholders continuously because. Your team, your suppliers, your customers, your investors. Um, I think if you're making a lot of changes, uh, you know, you should be communicating with them for them to realize that there is a lot of thought and logic going into these changes um, and, and to kind of continue to be confident and clear about where the company is going. And, and lastly, I'll say that to focus on the fact that, you know, survival is success. It's not popularity. So there are likely to be many, many decisions that are going to be made now or are being made that are not going to make uh, entrepreneurs popular. But they have to be clear in their mind that um, their, their, their goal, first and foremost, beyond health and safety of their team, is, uh, is survival, not popularity. I, I want to pick up on two of the points you mentioned there, one being the capital and the other being sort of the pivot from, say, their own vision to the extreme of hand sanitizers. We recently reported on a NASCOM survey, and in that survey, about more than more than half, actually, of their startup respondents said they were looking at a business model pivot as their best option for pulling through and surviving this crisis. Uh, is this, do you feel this is the best solution? I was wondering if you can elaborate on that, because you have your marquee startups that are funded by some of the biggest investors in the world, but many startups they live they live on their round to round. So, I mean, what is the what is the best strategy for that? Well, I think every situation is different, so it's hard to give kind of a general solution. But uh, I'll just give a few different um, kind of possible approaches. Mm-hmm. So, in, in terms of you know conserving capital. Uh, you know, there are a few different approaches. So one is uh, cutting costs. And, they, you know, one is you, you can cut uh, non kind of people fixed costs, but often people are the biggest fixed cost. So, you know, w- w- one way to go there is to you know, really try and, and, and focus more on, on pay cuts or furloughing than actual layoffs. Right. Because, uh, you know, you, know, it's, it, you, you, you may have spent years building up such a high quality talent pool, building culture, uh, building a cohesiveness between your team that uh, that's a very valuable asset. So to let that go so quickly is, um, you know, should, shouldn't be done. And, um, and also, uh, obviously, the, the human aspect of it during this time is particularly uh, sensitive. You know, we're not talking about laying off people during a, a boom time where there are plenty of other jobs left mm-hmm. out there in the market and they can quickly join someone else who can make better use of them. So I think you have to be very sensitive to that. Um, I, I think on, on uh, another hand, in terms of liabilities, reducing them, uh, deferring them, you know, th- there may be, this may be a great time to do that because people are more open to that. 
uh, now than than they have been in years. I think also the you know selling non-core assets. Uh, that's something like uh, my team and I did very well at Snapdeal, where um, you know we sold uh, a few of the companies Snapdeal owned and generated you know a significant amount of capital that essentially saved the company. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, depending on on the particular situation, you may have that. Because raising capital from investors now is very very tough. Um, maybe existing investors, but new investors is I think particularly tough. And I, and I think even shutting down non-core aspects of your business. I mean, you know, in, in boom times, companies tend to expand geographically. They tend to expand to different business lines or service lines. Um, you know, sometimes it's experimentation on possible expansion paths. Uh, but right now is not the time for that, mm -hmm. generally speaking. It's the time to focus on core. So core product lines, service lines in core market and maybe cut out all the rest. Because so can you put can can you put can you put because because the follow up I had to that was that you have uh, your mature startups or your platforms that are deeply entrenched in one model and they have gone ahead and laid off a lot of thousands of employees. You have your Ola, your Sapato, your Swiggy. Can you yeah. put this in the context of that? Say I'll I'll, I'll give an example. Say of um, one example I worked on. Uh, <laughs> say housing.com. Uh, yeah. Housing.com, you know, had very, uh, very, a very kind of bloated cost structure. Uh, when, when I was the CEO, it had 3,000 people. It was operating in, I think, over 30 cities. It had many different product lines from buying and selling homes to rental to paid guests to hostels to commercial real estate. And, you know, essentially what we, what we found out was that 80% of the market we were targeting was uh, firstly, in the top seven cities, not the top 30 cities. Uh, secondly, we realized uh, the kind of the, the, the revenue model we had, 80% of the revenues are going to be generated from buying and selling homes, uh, not even rent. Even though we got massive traffic and engagement on rent, we were not able to convert that to monetization or revenue. So we said, you know, during a time when we actually had three months of runway, by the way, uh, we said we have to make some very decisive calls and cut everything but buying and selling homes in the top seven cities. And, um, and we reorganized our teams uh, to also make them even more effective than they were with a much higher cost base. And we were able to kind of cut 80% of our costs and actually uh, eventually significantly increase our revenues and our traffic and our engagement and our number of homes listed. So, um, but again, that's very specific to that situation. That there will be similar companies, you know, maybe Ola is operating. I, I, I'm just hypothesizing here. I don't have any inside information on Ola right now. But maybe Ola determines that uh, you know, India is their core and uh, certain other markets are not. So maybe they do a disproportionate amount of cost cutting there. Um, maybe they realize that, you know, ride hailing, ride sharing, uh, mobility is really their core, but um, you know, leasing cars is not critical to their core. Maybe payments is not critical to their core. So again, they disproportionately cut there. Uh, maybe then they say uh, among their core, they can take, you know, they have maybe spent years building a very high quality talent pool that they don't want to lose them because we don't know when we're going to go back to normal, right? What if it happens in a few months? The rehiring is very costly. It's very tough. Uh, people may not want to come back. You may need to hire new people, retrain them. Uh, they may not be a cultural fit, et cetera. So maybe you 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 uh, encourage furloughing or pay cuts, and 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 you start at the top. You know, CEO founders take an, uh, are set the example, and everyone sort of frankly shares the pain. Um, and then and it's not indefinitely. It's sort of until things are back to normal, and the company can afford to go back to the old pay levels. And then everyone kind of gets it back in a similar proportion. So this is just kind of broadly how um, how I would suggest approaching it. So you pointed out a lot of um, um, leveraged model is going to be a very difficult hypothesis for a lot of startups. So does this uh, crisis is a call for us to change the complete paradigm shift in terms of the business model? I'm not sure about that. You know, it's, again, hard to generalize. It depends on which company industry we're talking about. Some are far more affected than others. Um, you know, like, for example, say commercial real estate. 
Um, you know, now people obviously are realizing that working from home can be very effective, very efficient in some, you know, depending on the kind of work you do, companies we're talking about, some are finding it to be even more effective and efficient. So, but does that mean, you know, companies will not have offices anymore? I, I don't think so. Uh, does that mean that companies may be more flexible in terms of working from home um, and that there might, there might generally be more of a hybrid model? Uh, probably. Uh, and that means a company with 100 people may not need a seating capacity for 100 people. They may say, okay, we can, uh, at one time, we'll only see 25% of our workforce. So we need, we need less commercial real estate. And, um, and therefore, the demand for commercial real estate goes down. So I, I think we have, you have to look at each uh, specific situation to see how it's likely to change. But I, I, I think it's also important to realize that, you know, this is a black swan event by any definition. Uh, I, I don't think anyone could have really predicted this happening and the extent in which it's affected all of us. So to overcorrect for the long term may not be the right move either. It's one thing to be, you know, to kind of adapt to the situation, but, but to assume that this is the new normal when we're sort of clearly in a transitional mode, I think might be a mistake. So I, I would say rather than completely changing your company um, for this transition phase, I would say maybe to um, to build adapt adaptability and flexibility into your company DNA and modify what you're doing, but also to be also to be ready to modify it back or in a different way depending on how, how things eventually stabilize. So, in your opinion, how well did the Indian business ecosystem responded to the crisis? Did you, in your experience, also did you feel that some of the turnaround theory theories could have well? Uh, applied in a better way? It's very hard to kind of uh, speak generally about India broadly because, you know, there's so many different situations and, and I don't feel I'm in a place to kind of judge how everyone else is, is handling it. I, I wouldn't feel right doing that. But, but I, I'll, I'll say that I, I've been overwhelmingly kind of feeling positive on how quickly leaders have um, <clears throat> generally... Uh, accepted that the, you know the situation and been decisive. I mean, not everyone has been through a turnaround situation. Not everyone wants to be in a turnaround situation, but pretty much every business leader in the world is being forced into a turnaround situation. So um, it's not meant for everyone. But I feel so many people have stepped up, you know, their their leadership and um, have gone above and beyond to to try and adapt their organization accordingly to the situation. So I've been very positive, actually, in, in what I've heard and, and, and read. So then in sort of as a final question, I wanted to ask you, you told us about, you know, the kind of reaction you had to how the Indian business ecosystem, or at least the part of it that you have read about or, or sort of been exposed to has responded to this crisis. How does it compare with the rest of the world? whether you're talking about companies in, in places like China, Taiwan, or whether you're talking about, you know, US, the UK, Europe, I mean, is there any sort of, um, maybe not lessons, but is there any sort of comparisons, points of comparison that we can draw? Or even the government interventions. Again, it's very, it's very hard to kind of compare across entire economy. But I, I would say that, that, you know, emerging markets like India, and India even more than China, and China even more than the US, I think the advantage we have is we're already pre-COVID, we're operating in a very fluid environment, right? In an environment where uh, regulation in so many sectors was changing, competition was changing, FDI was changing. So I, I think people were already built, already kind of strengthening that uh, adaptability muscle. And um, <clears throat> whereas I think in some of the more mature, stable markets, uh, they were less conditioned to do that. So I, speaking very broadly, and again, this is uh, might be a bit of an overgeneralization. I, I've been, I think, more positive about India, China, emerging market leaders and how quickly they've adapted because they're already used to adapting to things, maybe not, not as big as COVID-19, but, but still a lot of changes. I mean, the number of regulatory changes that have happened in India in the past year alone is massive. I mean, but uh, many for the net positive long term, but there's still... Massive changes to operate in and leaders have have learned to adapt. So I, I think they've been uh, 
maybe even more fluid, more adaptable, more flexible than uh, some of the leaders in other more mature, stable markets. You know, I think two notes of positivity is better than one and as good a point as any to end on. So, Jason, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your insights with us. And hopefully the next time we all sit down for a chat or for a recording, it will be face to face and not over, you know, a, a, a voice call. Hopefully we will be past this by the, time, the next time. Thank you, Narendra. And uh, one thing I, I just want to mention in addition to... Yes, to please. Is that you know I uh, <clears throat> I recently wrote a book for Harper Collins called Irrational Action that sort of details out some of the turnaround experiences I've had and of course when I was working on this with Harper Collins I never realized we never realized that it would be so relevant to the time uh, that it's released in um, and I've gotten a number of uh, messages from entrepreneurs who really benefited from some of the very honest, authentic, open stories that have been shared in that book. So I, I think, uh, you know, the, beyond just my book, which I, I yes, I, I do think can benefit people, I think it's important for there to be a very open, candid conversation among leaders to learn from each other and lean on each other during this uh, very difficult time. Definitely. A third point. I mean, in, in this case, I wouldn't say three is a crowd. But uh, again, thanks, thanks so much for your for your time for your insights. Uh, where can where can where can people find your book? Can they find it through HarperCollins? Can they find it on all online publishers? Where can people find your book? Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, pre-COVID, it was available at all the all the bookstores, and uh, it's available on Amazon, uh, both uh, via Kindle as an ebook, and uh, it was available and will be available soon as a hard copy book, and um, and all the proceeds are going to charity. No, oh, that's that's even that's even better. So uh, well, a fourth note, but I think that's a lot of positivity now, and it's even good, uh, even good place. Okay, so I think with that note, then Radish, thanks so much for joining us as well today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for a fantastic conversation. Thanks so much for having me.